I am very happy to have you here in this data analytics course in Python. First of all, I'm going to show you the agenda, how we are going to work during this time. First of all, we are going to understand what is Python and how are we going to work in the different uh, IDEs. After that, we are going to install the tools that we are going to use during the course. We are going to learn about the libraries and basic notations in Python. After that, I'm going to teach you about the variables and the different type of data structures. And uh, from this step, from the data running, we're going to work with how to clean data sets, how to prepare all of our data. After this, we're going to make a first step of the exploratory data analysis. Here, we're going to talk about uh, statistics. And after that, the second step of the uh, exploratory data analysis, in, we, in which we are going to use the univariate analysis, the bivariate analysis, and finally, the multivariate analysis that are going to give us all the information about what is trying to tell us the data. After that, I'm going to give you a, a little taste of the important topics in a data science project. Uh, there is the principal component analysis, reduce the dimensions of our data sets. And finally, if you love this topic and you love my course, uh, I'm going to show you the next steps for you to work in this area. I am Juan Felipe Gonzalez. I am from Colombia, from Bogota. Um, I am an industrial engineer. Uh, currently, I am in uh, the master's degree in analytics for business intelligence. I work as senior data analyst and have experience, uh, some years of experience, being tutor in data analytics and data science courses. Perfect. So, what is Python? Python is a high-level cross-platform programming language with focus on readability and simplicity. So, it is widely used in web development, in data science, in artificial intelligence. Uh, about the name, uh, the name is due to the creator, uh, Giro Van Roosmans, bonus for the English humor Monty Python. I don't know if you know Monty Python, but uh, the name of this programming language uh, has no relation with the snake. So, what are the four most important topics? First of all, syntax simple and easy to learn. We have loops and conditionals that allow us to have perfect control flow. Uh, libraries, we have a lot of libraries for all uses. And finally, data processing is fast and effective to process data. We have lots of IDEs, integrated development environments, IC Charm, Visual Studio Code, Spider, Jupyter, uh, Google Collab, Sublime Test, and Anaconda. Okay, Anaconda is more, more a platform that are directly an IDE, which are some of the apps and institutes that works with Python. First of all, Instagram for backend and automation. We will use Python for Google search and Google maps. Reddit, Reddit using web pylons framework. Netflix for all the data process. Spotify use web Django. Uh, this is another framework and I'm going to make a course for Django and some universities that use Python for their analysis and, and projects, MIT, Harvard, California. So the ideas that we are going to use are Jupyter and Google Collab. The reason is in first place because it's very popular today. It's easy to understand and easy to connect. These two tools are familiar, are like cousins, and look such the same. The difference, Jupyter will be installed on our computer and Collab is going to be in the cloud. So how are we going to install both of them? It is important to clarify that this course can be taken by anyone, even if you don't know anything about Python or even an expert level. <clears throat> However, I will not be able to pause on every basic topic. But, important, this will not mean that you do not understand the topics. You can make this course without any fear. First of all, you will get in anaconda.com and python.org. Here is too simple. You are going to download Python, the last version that show you. In this case, when I'm recording the course, is 3.11.1. You are going to click this one and it's going to download. As I already have the version, I am not going to download it. And Anaconda. Here you have options for Windows, Mac, Linux. In this case, I'm going to download 
for Windows. So you're going to find the setup. You only click Next, Agree, and you're going to accept all the stages. As you finish the installation, you're going to find this folder, Anaconda Tree, and you're going to click on Jupyter Notebook Anaconda Tree. It is going to open this interface, and here we are going to open Documents, New, Folder. So, for example, you are going to rename as Python Data Analytics. You are going to put new Python 3. And here you will have all the Python for development. This is how we work in Jupyter. And what about Google Collab? You will get in your drive, click here, and in more. Google Collaboratory. If you don't find this option, you are going to put here in Connect with more applications. And you will search for Collaboratory. Only download it and you will find there in your menu. And there you will have the same structure from Jupyter, but, but in your Google Drive. Let's begin with the learning directly in the Python code. So first of all, libraries and orientation. What is a library? It's a collection of functions developed by individuals or group of developers. So imagine that there is an intelligent person in somewhere in the world, the reason you see here a, a huge brain, develop some functions, huge code that is making easy or quick some process in the Python development. What this intelligent person is going to do is put all of knowledge for the world and is going to be free. Most of the libraries are free. So we are going to find important developments and important functions directly in one library. Our first notion in Python and Colab are going to be main structures to manage data, understanding the data frame, and loading the data set from a CSV. So first of all, I'm going to ask you to make a new folder in your drive. So as you can see here, I have Udemy courses, Python, and Python in English put here Google Collaboratory, and it is going to create me a new Google Collab Data Anomaly. All of these cells are going to be spaces in which we are going to develop all of our code. We can also add text. It's going to be text. Code must be executed, and if we put play, it is going to show us an error because test is not defined yet. Perfect. As we were talking about libraries, I'm going to show you how are we going to import all of those libraries. Import pandas. So as I put import pandas, it is going to bring me, as you can see, this check. If you have any trouble standing pandas, you can put pip install, and it is going to begin to downloading and installing the library. Normally, we put a nickname to the libraries to be more efficient. So for example, pandas is our library for data analysis and data process. Also, we will have NumPy and we are going to call it NP. This is going to help us working with arrays and math, math operations. One important to have in, in our bucket is statistics. We are not going to put a nickname and it's all of the mathematical. We are going to import matplotlib with the extension of pyplot. This is going to help us to plot all of our analysis. If you have any problem installing any of these libraries, please contact me in the Udemy chat. And we are going to take Plotly with the extension of Express, allow us to create entire figures at once. And finally, we are going to use Seaborn SNS. This is going to help us with data visual. So these are the common libraries that we use when we are making data analysis. All of them are going to interact to help us to have insights about the data sets that we are working on. Once we have all of our libraries, we are going to execute and we will have this green check. Perfect. So first of all, uh, I'm going to teach you about the data types of Python and how can we structure data in different spaces. We are going to print what type of data is this 8? It's integer. So if we make the same thing, but with 8.8, .8, it's going to be a float, a decimal number. We can also have one, but it is going to be a string. All of characters, all of words are going to be strings. And finally, we can have binary or Boolean type true or false, blue, true or false, it's going to be blue. If we put here one, what is going to execute us? One. So one plus three is going to be four. The same if we put, for example, uh, 1.5 and 2. Point. This is an integer and this is a float, but both are 
folders. I'm going to print one at Felipe. What is going to happen? One Felipe is going to print the concatenation of both strings. For example, if we want to put a space, quotes and space. Integers, floats, and we are working with the strings, you have to put quotes. What happens if we don't put those quotes? Perfect, and execute it. Mm, name of one is not defined, bearing a variable error. When you don't put quotes to any character, it is going to assume that is a variable. So what happens if I put here, for example, one equal to one plus three, and I put Felipe one plus Felipe equal eight, and also I can show one individual four and perfect. Now I'm going to introduce you on how we can save or capture data in a space, a tuple or a list. Perfect, so tu tuple or list. We are going to save our previous variables in a tuple. That is like a box, so we imagine a bag, putting all of our variables in that bag. One, maybe. And we are going to put maybe an eight. Print our tuple, perfect. Type of data is tuple, so here we have integer float a string bool and we have tuple we can use lists one Felipe, and this eight i'm going to put it as a variable 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 equal to eight and here we have both of them our tuple and our list what sign of data list very good if we print both of them you can see that we have the same data the difference the parentheses the circle parentheses and the square parentheses so you may ask, would using both result in the same thing? And no, are not the same. Imagine that we have a little store. And our store sell gone cheese and avocado. Very good. And we have prices. So here we have our little store. Gum, cheese, avocado, 10, 20, and cherry, their respective prices. Imagine that the producers are having some trouble with the avocados. So you will have to change the price of the product. In Python, the tuples and the list goes from zero to the last item. So for example, in this case, here, if we go to B2, we are going to find Terry. Remember, B0 is going to be the first item. It's going to be 10. And for example, if we put B3, we don't have B3. We only have B0, B1, and B2. We have to change the B2 price from Terry to 40. Here, this one, and it's going to say us tuple object does not support item assignment. Tuples are not mutable. You cannot change data. You cannot change values inside the tuple. We will make the same process, but with a list. How do we change from tuple to list? With the brackets. We have different type of bracket. B2 change from Terry to Foray, execute. So if we print again, we will have that change. Here, as we are using little vectors, it's simple, but when you are making high a type of code, lot of rows of a script, this is going to be important. You will want to change some values. And in this case, you will be aware to use list. And if you want that there is one vector without any changes, you will need a tuple. Now we are going to understand the data frame. It's the most important structure when we are analyzing data. And I'm going to show you why. Imagine again that we have our store and we want to put that store in our in a data frame. Data frame. Pandas, the library that we use here, pandas, pd point data frame to zip both of our lists put zip a and b and our columns both product and price very good so as you can see here it's a beautiful way here we have an index and our columns with the respective data as you can see the data frame is made by lists imagine that your store is getting bigger and you have to add a new product the way to do this is we are going to copy our data frame. We are going to lock because we are going to use the row item. So we are going to add a three index row and we are going to sell apples. Let's put five. And again, we are going to print our data. frame. As you can see, well, now we have Apple $5 of costs. And also, for example, imagine that now, yeah, as your store is famous, you will have to manage quantity stops. 
add a new column. The way to do this is how are we going to call this column? We are going to put a stock, yes? And the stock, imagine that we have five gum, eight cheese, 10 avocados, and two apples. And again, we are going to print our data frame. Perfect, so we have our product, price, and a stock. What happened if we put, for example, here another stock, put three? It is going to say us, length values five do not match. So, this is a very important thing, a structured data. Normally, a structured data is going to be shown as a table, as you can see here. We got this structure with CSV, text, or Excel files. If we have semi-structured data or unstructured data, we can handle in Python, but we will need a previous process before inserting all of this data into the data frame. Now we are dipping in one of the most important steps in a data analytics project, the data grounding. This is called normally the cleaning process. Here we are going to prepare our data set to be perfect in perfect conditions for all type of analysis, from a descriptive analysis until all of the machine learning models to predict <clears throat> the future. We have a lot of possible paths in the cleaning process, but there are three important stages that we cannot forget in this cleaning. <clears throat> the duplicate values, the null values, and the outliers. Also, in this step, we can make some other columns, some calculations, changes in the data frame, but these three are one of the most important. So we are going to make a practical case and we are going to use a data set that I extract from Google, a psychological data set. So what we are going to find in this file, we will have uh, four files that describe in a qualitative way the person that is making the pool. And also we will have 11 fields with numeric date. So for example, the Q1 enthusiastic. So he or she put a number to describe the psychological status. We are getting into our folder. You're going to download the resource that is in this lesson to drag the file into the folder of the project. As you can see here, site data set in English. Very good. Again, to our collaboratory, we are going to obtain the link. Please put here to anyone, copy, put the link. You can put comments with this character. So please put URL. This is a default way called the URL. This is a default way to copy this segment and put in your script data. We're going to take this from the number until the last slash, that segment. I'm going to call it the FPC, CSV, URL plus data. And in this case, we will have our data frame ready. Perfect. So here we have all of our rows and we have 16 columns. For example, uh, this is an index, so we can take this column away. Age, marry the status, orientation, and the different questions that we saw here in the presentation. Here we are getting the context of the data frame. People with age, with marital status, with sensual orientation, and with religion that answer all of these questions about how he or she is managed feelings. So if he's enthusiastic, self-disciplined, anxious, quiet, difficult to relax, and felt sad and depressed. Okay, it's going to be an interesting project. So here we have the results. We will have always to print our data frame and understand some of the rows. So for example, the first person, 16, is a teenager, not married, is a terror, religion, is a, and the respective answers. Our data grounding process is going to be, first of all, I think that we don't need this column, drop person. We are going to take a look on nulls, duplicated values, the outliers, qualitative and quantitative values. Very good. This is our data running plan. Drop is too easy. The FPC. We have to use drop. It's too simple. Only using drop. Which column we will have to drop. And the column is the zero. Is the first one. So it's the zero. And we will ask it <clears throat> to apply in axis one. It will apply this change in all of our rows. So we don't have now or person. Now we are going to analyze the duplicated. Why is important to manage the duplicated? Unless financially or contextually, we know there must be duplicates. All of them must be removed is the normal process. I'm going to call a variable dupli, and we are going to find in first place if we have any duplicates. So do 
duplicate it. Okay, very good. Here we have a lot of duplicated. 156 duplicated. Let's understand from the total of rows how many do we have in percentage. Bring the length method. So it's too simple. It's going to show us how many rows we have in our data frame. And we are going to make a simple operation. Dupli divided in length. So less than the 1% of our data is uh, duplicated. So we will not be afraid to delete all of those duplicated values. 5% or more of duplicated is important to analyze the origin of that data set. Let's identify our duplicated values. So I'm going to put show. So we are going to try to use our data frame. Uh, show that. Very good. Okay. And the process we will carry out is DF data frame and we will drop the duplicates. So now, we will corroborate here if we have any duplicate. We don't have any duplicate value. There is a reduction in rows. Now, managing the nulls and the outliers, first of all, the nulls, uh, we have two possible paths. So system nulls occur when the system has a general failure. For example, <coughs> if uh, we have a company that makes nodes and use sensors to check their dimensions. Uh, these sensors fails every morning and stop recording data. This is our scenario. In this case, it is advisable to take the sample again because this is data that we cannot recover. But in case of random nulls occur when the failure is not structured and perhaps it can be due to a manual error in some registers. If the number of rows that have nulls is not a large number or uh, if don't change the distribution of the variable, it is possible to delete those rows. Uh, if it is not possible to delete the rows, we will have to do a permutation process that predicts the nulls values. On the outliers, for example, we are analyzing a data set of docs. As you can see here, we have a lot of docs. Uh, what is the big goal? Oh, there is no big goal. But okay, so we have all of these docs and we have a row or, or some rows or description of whales. So as we are making an analysis of those docs, these whale values are outliers. And, and we must uh, analyze what to do with all of those numbers. If we go again to our data frame, first of all, we are going to manage the nulls, all the values of the data frame. Perfect. So as we can see here, we have the column. How many nulls do we have and the D type? Here we have different numbers. The same number in all columns entail that we don't have any null value. But in this case, we have different values. So it's important to take a look on them. Show all of null values. So here we have our five or five rows with nans. So as you can see, for example, the seven question, all of these nans. What is making this method is counting how much nuns do we have in each column. And here we are taking a look into the rows that have all nuns. All of these cases are horrible because we don't have data to make permutation. For example, if in this row we only find one NAN value, it could be easy to make a permutation process in which we predict this number. But as we have a lot of NANs, there is no data structure to make this process. So we are going to delete them. The way to do this is again using the drop, but here we are going to use the drop NAN values. Perfect. Review. This perfect. So here we have the same number of non nulls. Outliers in the analysis, if we don't treat them, are going to have a lot of weight in our analysis and can manage to have very bad results. It's important to treat them like using a magnifying glass and work on them. One method that is commonly used to outliers is the box plot, as this is a, a method when we are analyzing the exploratory data analysis. In this case, we are using the box plot to find the outliers. I'm going to declare a variable. Take a look on the question eight. Set all of the parameters of the figure. Fix size. This is the standard line when we are going to manage different size of the figure. PLT box plot the bar. We have the plot, all the values from the question eight. As we can see, we don't have any values here. So it's not it's not a beautiful uh, plot. 
So what we can do here is we are going to take BX that we already import in the library section to plot all the values. So we are going to have the box plot, the normal box plot, and we are going to have also the box plot, but with values. The bottom of the possible values, one, and the higher value, four. So, okay, we don't have here any, any outlier. Okay, so the process is looking at all of the questions and all of these uh, variables and try to understand if there is a outlier. But if we make one question per question is going to take us a lot of time. Let me show you a, a quick method to make this. A subset of our data frame only to analyze the, the number, the numeric variables. So here I extract Marriott or orientation and religion. Don't forget the X is one. Same process. I'm going to ask the box plot to plot all of the variables. Here we are going to use the melt method. <clears throat> So finally, we are going to make this a uh, interactive plot. Let's take a look. Perfect, box plots with the numeric variable. So as you can see here, we have the first question in a range of one to seven, perfect. One to seven, perfect. One to seven, perfect. Here we have our first outlier, 33. Here we have our second outlier, 71. Is you can see here that our box plots are telling us the truth. The six one, uh, one to seven, one to seven, and as you can see here, from the eight, from question eight to eleven, we have another range from one to four, one to four, one to four, and one to four. Here we have another outlier. So it's, this is the easiest way to map all of our outlier. As we don't have our H column, because I think that here we dropped the column. <laughs> yes, we dropped the column to uh, twice. OK, and also in H we have outlier. First of all, we're going to understand, for example, which is the, the, the number of the maximum H. So we put here the number of uh, the, our column and max max h okay it's impossible easiest way to extract that value we have seven rows in this case we have to decide as an analyst as a data data analyst or data specialist or data manager we can assume that someone print a, a, a wrong h and that we can manage it manually change this manually work with all of these values but here we are assuming that we can manage the data manually and in some cases, we will not have uh, the, the permission to do this. So in some cases, when we have outliers, it's important to put all the contexts in this operation and decide if we can manage to change this or we will have to delete the rows. In this case, I consider that since there are not many wrong, wrong rows, the data should not be manipulated manually. Um, we are going to delete these seven rows. So with this row, we are going to delete these seven rows, wrong rows. For example, if we take the other questions that have outliers, outliers, let's check the question four and show more that eight. It's only one row. Okay, very good. But we have here 33 using the same method that we use for the H. Perfect. So here we have our new rows, our new data frame. Perfect. So here we have, this is a normal range for age. Uh, all, all four questions are in the properly range. So in this way, we have all of our numeric variables without outliers. We cannot forget about non-numeric variables. Also find outliers there. We can also find some data that can contribute to wrong analysis. To be able to include these variables in some processing directly in Python, we will have to give them a process as numeric variables. Take a look. First of all, we are going to analyze the possible outliers to extract 
each category from each variable and to understand if all of them are in a, in a properly way. So for example, Marriott, here we have never previously married second and false. There is an error because this is not a possible status. Again, if we have context and in this context, false is uh, possible for this variable, we must work with this. But in this case, false is not a possible value. Now orientation, false, so ethereal, new types, homo, b, <clears throat> asexual and false. And finally, let's probably we will have the same false. Perfect. Yes. As you can see here, we have all, all of the religions and are false. Let's understand where is that false. Filter the false. OK, there is a uh, there is only one row. Here we have false in each <clears throat> of the non numeric variables. Let's check the same and the same. Perfect. We are going in this case to delete that row to assign to the data frame all of the rows and columns that don't have false in religion. In the three columns, we have the same false. So try to run again this where are we going to find nothing. Perfect. How can we change from non-numerical variable to a numerical variable? It is quite easy. One dictionary, I'm going to put matrimonio. In Spanish, only to have a guide, a, a key. And in here, we are going to put never. So we have never previously married and second one. Previously is going to be two. Perfect. So we, here we have all of our, of our array assignment to numbers. And the final process is we're going to put a new a new column that is going to be Marriott N of numeric, N of numeric, and we must apply this key to the actual Marriott. We're going to use map and what is going to do this line? It's going to build a new column and it's going to map based on these keys, the column Marriott. So we are going to execute and take a look on, so as you can see here, for example, never, 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 one, one. And we are going to make this with all of our non-numeric variables. I'm going to make this quickly. Orientation. And we are going to apply to orientation. Based on this dictionary. Perfect. And finally, creencia. The beliefs. Execute and now we are going to take a look on our new data frame. Perfect. So here we have orientation, ether is one, yes, perfect. <clears throat> now, before we begin with the exploratory uh, data analysis, we're going to segment our data frame three sub data frames. So here we are going to have all the one that we are being used, put all numeric. So the old numeric is all going to have only the numeric variables. We are all of these ones. Final data, perfect. The time has come and we are going to begin with the exploratory data analysis. Here we have the two types in which we are going to work, uh, the descriptive statistics and types of analysis to work with the descriptive statistics. We have two Categories. The first category, we have measures of central tendency, uh, the mean, the medium, the mode, and we have measures of dispersion, the range, the standard deviation. We are going to add a new cell in our code. How can we analyze the qualitative variables in terms of behavior of central tendency or dispersion? It is not sensible to apply means or deviation since in our variables we do not have ordinality. Or perhaps in, in marriage, in our Marriott category, but this is an order that we'll be assuming and may have not sense. So in this way, to understand the behavior of these variables, we are going to use the mode. What is the most repeated value? So it is quite easy, dot mode. Let's get the mode of all Marriott. Good, so mode. And we are going to print M. The most repeated value is never. Let's take all of our variable, the mode of all of our value. Here we have the mode of all of merit, orientation, and religion. But I want to show you how to put this quickly in a data frame. Here a uh, list. I put it campus. You can put it fields or any other way. So merit, the modes, 
another list. And finally, we are going to make here a data frame using And finally, we are going to call our... Okay, so Marriott, the most popular, the most repetitive value is never. Orientation, etereo, and religion, musulman. Okay, very good. Interesting. So here we have the mode of our qualitative variables. How are we going to take the mean of the other variables? It's simple. We are going, for example, in this case, to take the mode of age. Very good. The mean age in this case is 20, 23, 23 and maybe and a half years. Very good. But if we make this process with each variable, it's going to take us a lot of time. So a very good method that is described and is going to bring us a resume of all of our numeric variables. Take a look. Here we have the mean. The same from here. To have the mean, the standard deviation, the mean value, the max value. If you remember the standard deviation and the mean, here we have in the central, in the central part of the of the plot, and here we have the standard deviation to the right and the left side. What does this mean in, for example, the age variable? So here we have 23 years, but the dispersion of this age, but the dispersion of this age will be eight years. 8 years more than 23 and 8 years less than 23. So between 15 and 33, sorry, 31 years with mean. And this is the way we can analyze the standard deviation and the mean. So for example, for these variables that are from 1 to 4, from 1 to 4, let's take for example this one. The question number 8, here we have, if we, if we round it, for example, 3, and the standard deviation will be 1. And to four. This is not giving us much information. And this is the reason why we will have to use more mathematical and visual tools. Hola, 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 hola. In the second part of the exploratory data analysis, we are going to talk about the different types of analysis. First of all, the univariate analysis. We are going to take a look on histograms, box plots, bar chart, the bivariate analysis with the correlation, the heat map, the pair plot, the box plot with two variables, for example, and the multivariate analysis. I'm going to take a look on the face grid, the box plot of three variables. So in this case, we're going to put here univariate analysis. The idea in this step is to take single variables and take analysis over them. The question eight, we're going to plot a box plot and take an insight from the result. It is going to be simple. We are going, as always, set the, the size set the figure that we are asking question eight and ask the library to plot the box plot we're going to put a little bit of information here so here we have the mean that is like in this part and here we have the standard deviation. We can now write an insight. We can say, for example, that the largest number of people stay in the highest values of the variable. Very good. So here we have our plot and the insight. In this case, as we are only taking into account one variable, we cannot get deeper into the insight. Now, for example, let's take the violin plot. We are going to analyze the age. The violin plot shows us how does the all of the values distribute in all of the range. It's similar to the box plot, but in this case, we can also understand in a continuous way how is the behavior of the values. Let's also plot the box plot. We have the same structure in both plots, but we can also analyze between 25 and 35 years, we have also important data. So here the violin plot can help us to see the, the data in a continuous way. And the box plot is showing us like a discrete behavior of the data. Now, let me show you how we can plot a count plot that is similar to a histogram. As always, the figure size.
So here we have the size, here we have the, the plot, here we have label age and uh, the extrix where we are going to put a rotation of 90. So here we have in a bar cone plot, the si a similar behavior from the violin plot, but with the names in both edges. If we want a histogram, we are going, going to put his plot. And as you can see, is the same from the from this cone plot, but this is beautiful. What about the insight? So the insight in this case, we are going to put ages. Ages are focused like uh, from 18 to 25 years, more or less. We don't have much older people. So how can we write this insight? So the population focus on young adults between 18 and 25. But this is like an empty insight. We can also add here. I have one idea. Let's put a yes. What I'm going to do is. I'm going to count how many people uh, 15. From here, from 52, the right and uh, analyze a percentage between all the total of the ages. Yes, len. So here we're going to use len. Len uh, returns len, the length of an object. Uh, older than 55, put this. Total length from ages, from total length from this one, divided into length of all the ages. So less than the 1% from the total. So we can also add this. There are some. So all of these ones represent like the 1% of all the people in our project. Now let's analyze, for example, the question three. Again, again by all in plot, X is going to be all Q3. Okay, very good. So we got here the result, and for an insight, let's add one more plot. Let's add our count plot. And uh, let's change this. The question three is about the ansiety. Ansiety of the ansiety. Oh, very good. Okay, so here we have our count plot. How can we develop here our insight? Is easy. Uh, ansiety and easy irritation respond to high values. We can also add some percentage. So let me show you. So here we are going to count all of the values from Q3 on a data frame. So here we have the count of, of each possible option to a new variable. All of the ones that are high, for example, from 5 to 7. Here we have, this is the sum of all of the high values and the total. So here we have the total from, so the high values are going to be divided into total. Very good. So 74. And also we can analyze only the ones that are from seven. So we are going to print both values. High values are 74 and only seven. The value seven is 28%. So let's read that when it comes to anxiety. Anxiety value. Very good. So here we have our insight. Very good. Now, 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 no. Now we're going to talk about the bivariate analysis. The most important plot when we are talking about bivariate analysis is the heat map. In which we are going to find the correlation between variables. So first of all, we are going to put the parameters of our figure.
is another, another way to implement the figure size. Very good. So again, the normal process, the size, the figure that we need, all of the labels or titles or uh, X settings, edges settings, and finally plot. So we are going to put a title and finally the plot. So I'm going to fill all of the, the spaces. The most important parameter of a, of a of the heat map is the correlation of the numeric variables. And this is the here we have I'm going here to put the the um, The colors of our the colors of our heat map are going to be blue and purple. It's very good. So let's print. So the important thing here is that if we have white or purple values are going to be correlated, cor correlated. Those are going those are going to be correlated. And if we have blue values, there is not going, this method is not going to help us to know if those are correlated or not. So for example, take a look, the, the, the Marriott status normally is correlated with the with the age, with the age. We have that the Q3 is is correlated with the Q8 answer. So how are we going to traduce this into an insight? So let me show you. In first place, what I'm in first place, what I'm looking here is that people that feel the negative emotions or graded exaltation uh, have positive correlation with feelings of sadness. Are we are we Do you agree? And also um, the people with calm have fewer indicators of sad emotions. So let's write this. And also, uh, the more calm
So here we have our insight about this correlation, uh, about this heat map. And this is a compare. Here we are analyzing. We are analyzing pair. pair. We, are we are analyzing pair of variables. As you can see, here we have one variables in front of other variable. Now let's try to to make let's make a box plot with two variables. It's too simple. We are going to take from here the size. In this case, we are going to bring. We're going to analyze question six and question nine. Well, you know. So, okay, we have to write in the proper way. <laughs> Show, very good. So we, here we have the relation between disorganized, disorganized, disorganized values and uh, couldn't experience any positive feelings at all. So look this interesting thing. Hmm. So in this case, uh, So the more disorganized the person is, the more negative emotions is presenting. Interesting. So we, 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 need, we need to be organized with our lives and our things and our emotions. But now let's understand. Let's make an interesting Let's make an interesting bivariate analysis. I'm going to create a new column to a group the ages into different ranges. To do this, we are going to make a simple movement. 
So with this lock, we are going to introduce directly in the value of the column that we are asking. So all numeric, all numeric age. So if if the age is more than zero, yes, we are going to call this new uh, new column age group. And the value is going to be 20. Very good. And we're going to make all of this with all ages. So, for example, if it's 20, it's going to be under the range of 40, 40 under 60. So a age of 30, for example, is going to be under this range. We are going to take a look on our new column. So here we have, for example, age 48, between 40 and 60 age, 60 years. 21 is between 20 and 40 years. Very good. And now we are going to we are going to make a beautiful S seaborn seaborn box plot. So we are going to set a, a style just to show you that we have a lot of different possibles with this library. So we are going to analyze this new column, the age group, with the question three. And I'm going also to print to show all the means of this, the means of this box plot. What I'm making here, what I'm making here is that I'm going to group. This variable is going to group by age group and the means of all of the all of the values from question three. So based, based on the values of the question three, we are going to have this mean with the age be from 0 to 20 years, this mean from 20 years to 40 years, and here, and the same we know with all categories. And I'm going to round the result to only two decimals. Very good. I'm going to set up also the vertical the vertical offset with the means of Q3. And this is for the ubication of all the 
x for the j for the gx. Before I develop this, before I develop this four, I'm going to show you in this moment how we are. How we can visualize our box plots. Perfect. But we also need the values to be clear. For example, in this case, how we are going to compare the different means the different values. So this is the reason of why I, I am printing or printing the mean values. All of these are all of these are settings for all of these are settings for this box plot. So let me show you. Okay, where is the issue here? A mean mass vertical offset. No, it's Box plot in the text stick. Egg stick. Way my So very good, we have, oh, this is too small. So we are going to change this to uh, 11. Very, no, it's too small. Very good. So here we have the means. Perfect, it's interesting. So the question three is about, question three is about stress. So uh, it's about anxiety. Question three is about anxiety. So it's interesting that as you get older, 
you are going to, to see yourself, to perceive yourself like less, less stress. The insight will be, so our insight is going to be as you get older, Interesting this. Now, what happened if we change this to another? What happened if we change this to another question? So question two is about discipline. So is is question two is about discipline. So for example, our, our insight is going to be as you get older, the level of discipline. In which you perceive yourself is going to increase. Very good. So we have to be organized. As we get older, we are going to be less anxious and we are going to be more disciplined. In the best of the scenarios. And finally, I'm going to show you something that is called the profiling, uh, that is a very good way to present reports. This is the standard way to call the library and to make the process. So it's only to copy and paste. And I'm going to show you how this is, how the report, how the profile report builds these statistics. And now we are going to ask the profile to put all of this in our notebook. Very good.
Okay, so we have the report is done, my PyC project. So here what? So here we have the overview, all of the variables, and it is going to show us each variable, all of our variables. The um, so for example, most of our variables are most. It's going to show us the result for all of our variables, the numeric and non-numeric variables. Also, it's going is going to show you is going to show us the interaction between variables. It's uh, like a, a heat map, as you can see. If I put the same question, it's going to show you. So for example, age and question four. So here we have the age and question four. So most of the teenagers. So for example, age and question four. So most of the teenagers feel uh, quiet. Okay. Correlations, the same, the same one. The same that we already built, but we are with other colors. And here we have the correlation table. The missing values that we don't have any, the, um, any missing values. And here we have the raw data. So this is a way to present. To, it's a way to present univariate and bivariate. So this is a beautiful way to have. So this is a beautiful way. So this is a beautiful way to present univariate and bivariate analysis. As we cover the bivariate analysis, we are going now to talk about the multivariate analysis. And in this case, I'm going to talk to you about two important plots in any data science or data analytics project, the per plot and the facet grid. You are going to find all of them as seaborn per plot and seaborn facet grid. Very good. This is the seaborn page. And here you are going to find all of the possible plots. The pair plot is important because it's going to show you grid of access and you will be able to analyze pair of variables and also pair of variables, but with a hue that is going to change the color of the graphics. As you can see here, we have a lot of options to plot our data. And also we have the facet grid. In this case, we are going to plot labels of variables from our data set. So as you can see here, we can also compare pair of variables at a lot of more variables. In this case, for example, tip, total bill, we have time and also the gender. So we will be able to analyze a lot of variables in one plot. So first of all, we're going to take a look on the pair plot. It's too simple, all numeric. And the hue, in this case, I want to put the question 11. Perfect. So here we have our pair plot. As you can see here, we have all of futures out of our variables. And also here, all of our variables. Perfect. So let's take a look on one. Um, for example, uh, look this one. The question 9 with the question 3. 9 and 3. We also have the question 11, but it's present using the different type of colors. So let's analyze one of these boxes. Uh, for example, OK, look at this question 9 and question 3. What I understand from here is that uh, as more people uh, don't have positive emotions, they will feel anxiety and more depressed. So let's redact our insights. Uh, we can say that feel incapable in feel incapable 
So here we have one of the huge possible insights that we can analyze in each box, the facet grid. It is quite simple. We are going only to facet grid. And I will want to understand, for example, the relationship between age, uh, orientation, and question 10. In here, we're going to put question 10. And finally, we're going to ask it to show us the plot. This is an interesting result because 11 to 60 they have more red points as you can see is the highest value of the question 10. so in one hand we have that heterosexual people between 15 and 16 are the ones that have most difficult to relax and by the other way we can also say that as you can see here two and five bisexual and homosexual people over 40 years and achieve higher levels, as you can see, of relaxing, uh, where are predominant values from one and two. So let's redact our insight. So here we have a method to involve no one or two variables, but three or more variables in our analysis in only one plot. Finally, we are going to talk about the PCA or principal component analysis. <clears throat> in this process, we seek to, ma to maximize the projection of our data on a new vector basis so that the error of the projection is as little as possible. So, Basically, what we are making is if we have 38 variables, we are going to process a method that will find seven components or six or eight components represent the 38 variables. And it's going to be easy for our models or, or for our system to process only seven components. How does this work? So please take a look on this graph. Here we have feature one and feature two determine what vector that refers to component one and a perpendicular vector to that first vector <coughs> that is going to be the component two. Then we are going to rotate our data to the x-axis and subtract the average from each value. So this helps us to center the data to zero, as you can see here. Then we are going to make a projection of all of those center values to the direction to the first component, as you can see here. And finally, we are going to add the subtracted average values and rotate the data to its natural sense, as you can see here. So what are we making here? We are removing noise, as you can see here, and data that is contributed by the variance. We make a transformation from here to here. So how are we going to understand this in our code? First of all, the plan is to scale our data and to have values between 0 and 1. This is to standardize our data because we have values, for example, ages that are from 0 to 80, 90. And we have the results from our questions that normally goes from 1 to 7 or 1 to 4. After we apply a scalar, we are going to call the PCA transformation. After that, we are going to call the k-means, that is algorithm that is going to allow us to determine how many components do we need to use. And after we have the number of components, we're going to graph a scatter plot to see how it is going to help us to predict future values or the components are not going to help us with this. So first of all, I'm going to to show you a Skidlearn, that is the library that in this case is going to help us with the PCA. Skidlearn or Skidlearn <coughs> is an open source library that have a lot of machine learning features for Python. First of all, we are going to import the library, take the function. In this case, we are training min max scalar with all numeric data. And finally, we are going to transform. And now we are going to transform our data in the way that I showed you in the presentation. We are going to introduce all of this in a data frame. 
Here we have our scaled variables. The PCA algorithm. In this instance, we are only going to process the data with two components. And now we are going to apply the k-means algorithm to show, <coughs> to show how many components do we need. It is important to clarify that k-means is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm. In this case, it is supporting the PCR process to find out how many components are needed. You can also do the data science course on my channel. So here we have the values that correspond to each possible component. But this in number is not telling us nothing, so it's important to plot. The theory says that when we see that an elbow is formed, that is where the long awaited value is. So, for example, we can say that is like, I don't know, here or here. But as it is not easy to determine that value, I'm going to show you a method that I commonly use. So, the key elbow visualizer is going to help us to understand where is the key, where is the the final value for the components. Very good. So the key elbow visualizer is telling us that with four components, we can work all of our variables. Let's check a scatter plot. So first of all, we are going to calculate again, but with three, with four, sorry, components. Let's label the number of components. And finally, our scattered plot. Perfect. As we can see here, there is a clear way. As you can see here, we have the components clearly segmented. And if we use these four components to predict or analyze data, it could represent the reality of the initial variables. So this is the way we manage the PCA. If we have a lot of variables or if we want to represent in less futures the rest of the data set. Congratulations, because you achieved this data analytics course it's not easy, but now you have good knowledge, very good knowledge, to continue doing projects. I'll talk this time we did a project. I suggest you to continue doing different projects with different topics to show 
in your resume and, and in your interviews. Now, if you like all of this data world, you can delve into three possible topics. First of all, if you like all of the database system, how are we gathering all of the values and data before processing the data? You can make the course of SQL or MongoDB. You can also find this course in my channel. If you like all of this process of analyzing, an, <clears throat> analyzing data, developing a script and making prediction models, you can make the course of R and also make the course of Apache Spark. Machine learning models, deep learning, and also neuronal networks. And finally, if you like all of the plots and visualization, it's important for you to make a course of Tableau or Power BI or maybe Google Data Studio. I have also a course of these topics for you to improve your skills in visualization and way to display the data. Thank you very much and, and see you in the other course.